This is chapter 12, Ordinary People, page 95. At first, he was afraid that the hours after school would drag, but they do not. He fills them with studying at school or in town at the library. The old building is comfortable and secluded in dark with its narrow stained glass windows and soft leather chairs. He can stay there till, until 5.30 and make it home on time, or else he walks, keeping an eye on his watch, checking the time, down Deer Path, past the Presbyterian Church to the north campus of Lake Forest, where he can sit on a park bench and watch the birds. Nuthatches, creepers, chickadees, grosbeaks, he, thought himself he, he bought himself a bird book and is learning to identify them. Goes sedately and earnestly about their business, which is eating. He carries envelopes of sunflower seeds in his jacket pockets. He has his own life list. This month he has another activity, Christmas shopping. He wanders through the stores of the U-shaped outdoor mall, admiring the piles of merchandise in the windows. Sweaters, shirts, gloves, scarves, jewelry, sports equipment, shoes, the monotonous beauty of wealth. Crystal wine goblets on red velvet, onyx chess sets, Japanese cameras, golf clubs, books undaunted, the traditional Christmas scene stealers, carolers, carolers, coaches and horses, shepherds, angels, wise men, kings, do battle in the same windows with the tainted goods that surround them. Good for you, fight the good fight. He is not daunted either. Christmas means gifts and he puts his money down with the rest. Says, have a nice Christmas when he has handed his packages. You too, they say. Before class one morning, Lazenby corners him at his locker. What happened? Salen says you quit. He nods curtly. Why? The halls are teeming with people. My old frenzy. Two minutes before the final bell. I felt like it, he says. It was a bore. Some reason. He doesn't answer. Busies himself with rummaging in his locker for his chemistry book. Lazenby leans his elbow against the wall. Con, is something the matter? What do you mean? I don't know. He shrugs his shoulders, looking worried. Big, blonde, sincere type. When he was in the hospital, Lazenby wrote him his only letter told him the scores of the Cubs and White Sox games. At the bottom of the page, I miss you, man. He had read it a million times before he finally threw it away. Listen, don't worry, Conrad says. Everything's fine. I don't know, man. You've been acting funny lately. It trips the lever on the thing he meant not to say. Lays, take my advice. You hang around with flakes, you get flaky. Shit, I knew that was it. Well, why are you pissed at me? I'm not pissed. Ah, Connie, I know you. He tries a grin. Look, I'm sorry, I'd be pissed too, but you shouldn't have quit. That's not why. Man, I said it was a fucking bore. He slams his locker closed, giving the lock a savage twist as he walks away. Lazenby falls into step beside him. Wait a minute, listen, will ya? I talk to Salen and he says, Well, quit talking to people, he snaps. Leave me alone. The bell rings shrilly over their heads. They stare at each other. Ah, shit, Lazenby said. The hell with you. The, a hollow feeling in the pit of his stomach as if he has been punched. Never mind, screw him. Screw them all. All, They were Buck's friends anyway. He walks on to class, feeling nothing. So what does your dad say about it, Berger asks. He sighs, I haven't told him yet. How come? I don't know, the timing isn't right. He sweats everything so much. He'll just worry about it. So you haven't told anybody? Your mother? My mother? No, listen, my mother and I do not connect. I told you that before. So does that bother you? No, why should it? Berger shrugs. I don't know, some people it might bother, that's all. My mother is a very private person, he says. We don't ride the same bus. Who does? What do you have in common with your mother? Surface junk, brush your teeth, clean your room, get good grades. My mother... He stops. Careful, careful. People have a right to be the way they are, he says. Noble thought, Berger says. How's it going? You feeling better since you're not swimming? I guess. He pecks with his thumbnail at the wooden arm of the chair. Sleeping better? I jack off a lot. It helps. Berger grins. So what else is new? He slides down to the end of his spine, his legs stretched in front of him, staring at the floor. Over his shoulder, the clock ticks loudly. Come on, kiddo. Berger prods gently. Something's on your mind today. Nothing's new. Nothing's on my mind. I don't think anything. I don't feel anything. Abruptly, abruptly, he sits up. I ought to go home. Berger nods. Maybe so. What is it that you don't feel, huh? Anger? Sadness? Any of the 28 flavors? A tiny seed opens slowly inside his mind. In the hospital, the seed would grow and begin to produce thick, shiny leaves with fibrous veins running through them. More leaves to come, like tiny curled up fists they will hit at him. He tightens his grip on the arms of the chair. The wood is sticky and wet under his hands. He wets his lip nervous, lips nervously. What time is it? Lots of time, Berger says. The, eye, the eyes are fixed on him, a tender, compelling blue. Hey, remember the contact tract we got? You wanted to have more control. You see any connections here between control and this, what will we call it, lack of feeling? He closes his eyes, a jungle in there, inside his head. He opens them quite quickly. I didn't say I never feel things. I feel things. When? Sometimes. You got to give me the famine, wars, violence in the streets business again. He doesn't answer. Come on, kiddo. I'm doing all the work here. I thought you told me you didn't like to play games. I don't. I'm not. I don't know what you want. 
Then I'll tell you, I want you to leave. I want you to leave, I don't know, out there on the table with the magazines, okay? And what if I don't have an answer? You want me to make one up? Yeah, that'd be nice. Make one up, me up one right now about how you've turned yourself inside out and the overwhelming evidence is that there are no feelings in their know-how. I said I have feelings. Burger size. Now you, ha now you have them, now you don't. Get it together, Jarrett. Why are you hassling me? Why are you trying to get me mad? Are you mad? No. Burger sits back in the chair. Now that, he says, is a lie. You're as mad as hell. You don't like to be pushed. So why don't you do something? What? Geez, I don't know. Tell me to fuck off. Go to hell. Something. Fuck off, he says. Go to hell. Burger laughs. Glory, what feeling? When's the last time you got really mad? He says carefully. When it comes, there's always too much of it. I don't know how to handle it. Sure, I know, Burger says. It's a closet full of junk. You open the door and everything falls out. No, he says, there's a guy in the closet. I don't even know him. That's the problem. Only way you're going to get to know him, Burger, is to let him out now and then, along with the boots and tennis rackets, stale bread, whatever you got stored up in there. You go through it. You sort it out. You throw some of it away. Then you stack up the rest, nice and neat. Next time, it won't be such a big deal. I don't have the energy, he says. Kiddo, you got any idea how much energy it takes to hold the door closed like you do? That's power, your own personal power, and nobody else's. Sometimes, he says, when you let yourself feel, all you feel is lousy. Burger nods. Maybe you got to feel lousy sometime in order to feel better. A little advice, kiddo, about feeling. Don't think too much about it, and don't expect it always to tickle. On another shopping trip after school, with his head somewhere else, he sidesteps a puddle, nearly walking into someone coming the other way. Oh, she says, hi, how are you? Embarrassed, he mumbles an apology, then looks at her. It is Janine. What are you doing up here, she asks. I thought the swim, tree swim team practiced until six. They do, he says. I thought you were swimming. I used to, he says. I don't anymore. Oh, don't you swim as well as you sing? What? She laughs. Just kidding. I'm getting to know your voice now. You're a tenor who stays on pitch. He takes it as a reprimand. She should not be able to hear him above the others. I'll sing softer tomorrow. No. You know you ought to be doing the solo in that Russian thing. You have a much better tone than Ron. The voice of authority. He knows about her, that she has applied for a music scholarship to the University of Michigan, that she takes private voice lessons, that Farnham is in love with her ability. He has stood in the back of the auditorium after class listening to her practice while Miriam Gleason accompanies her on the piano, and Farnham stands next to her, stopping her in the middle of a phrase, instructing her. She nods her head gravely, goes back and repeats, all the time looking as if she is the music itself, and she is small and grave and beautiful. Her hair shimmers under the stage lights. Her eyelashes are light gold crescents. You want to have a Coke, he blurts out suddenly. She hesitates. Sure, fine. They walk together along the street, and she fills the spaces easily with words while he, amazed and dumbstruck at what he has just done, struggles with the overwhelming problems confronting him. Where will he take her? What will they talk about? The kinds of music that I like. He's the most classical-minded teacher, don't you think? Not Pasquis. It's always crowded after school, filled with people that he knows and yet doesn't know anymore. The windows are opaque with the steam of bodies. Just walking by the place reinforces his sense of separation. There's a place up around the corner, he says. Fine, it's near to my house. I have to be home by 4.30. My brother doesn't have a key. She looks at him, clear blue eyes like someone else's. With a start, he recognizes them. Burger's eyes. Weird. Inside the small, nearly empty coffee shop, it is not an in place, obviously. He, she loosens her coat, slips out of it. She is wearing a golden yellow striped sweater, a gold chain around her neck. He cannot look directly at her, focuses his eyes slightly to the left of her face. Well, she says, I'm doing all the talking. What kind of music do you like? He shrugs. I don't know, modern jazz, folk rock, whatever's around, I guess. You don't like classical? I'm not too familiar with it. Do you know Baroque? Telemann, Ortiz? No, tell me about them. Telemann and who? She looks down at her hands, flushing. What a dull conversation. I'm sure there must be things you'd like to talk about. He laughs, reaching into his back pocket. Sure. I carry a list around with me. Here, pick a subject. She looks up and then smiles at him. Why is this always so hard? The first time you talk to somebody, he calculates quickly. The first time, a second time, other times, and the tension within him dissolves. They talk about movies, about books, about his classes, her classes, what she likes, what they both don't like, about being new to his school and having to start over, making friends. She glances at her watch. Oh, I've got to go. He has fits if I'm late. He walks her to the railroad tracks where they stand and talk some more. It is snowing again, and she buttons her coat up to the neck, tucking her hair inside the collar. I told my mother to give him his own key. She works until six, and she doesn't like to leave the house open all day. He's eleven, but he's sort of scat of a scatterbrain. He's afraid. She's afraid he'll just lose it. Do you have brothers and sisters? No, he says, I don't. She makes a face. You're lucky. Anyway, 
Thank, thanks for the coke and thanks for walking me. The huge airy flakes sizzle away to nothing on his suede jacket. He watches her as she runs across the street. On the other side, she waves to him. He waves back and heads down western against the snow, keeping his head bent, staying close to the buildings. He would like to run, only the street is crowded with people. They would stare at him, wondering what the hell he was doing. Was he trying to stir up trouble? So many people in the world, so few behavior tracks. You can't even run anymore without attracting attention to yourself. And he turns his head as he passes the window of a travel agency. He stops, goes back to get a closer look. In the window, a model airplane, sleek and silver green, shearing off between two paper mache mountain peaks, held up by a thin shaft of wire from below somewhere, fastened to its body. Behind it, a travel poster, Ski the Lauritsians. He narrows his eyes, sees the path again, clean and clear, and dizzyingly, 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 dizzyingly steep, buck sweeping around the curve and disappearing. The wind screams in his ears. He blindly follows, staying up, staying up nearly to the end when the smallest of moguls flips him as he has let it cross his mind. That the slope is too hard for him, dangerous as hell skiing behind yourself. It is how you break a leg or get killed. And Buck bending anxiously over him. Hey, buddy, you okay? Talk to me. When he can breathe, when he knows that nothing is lost or broken, he wheezes feebly. I missed the goddamn turn. And Buck sits down beside him laughing. You were k killy himself coming around. What happened? I missed the goddamn turn. That's what happened. He hangs on now, pressing his hand lightly against the wall, below the window, waiting for the familiar arrow of pain. Only there is none. An oddly pleasant swell of memory. A wave of warmth flooding over him, sliding back slowly. It is a first. He looks around. The street behind him, the shoppers, the gray, dull gray parking meters near the edge of the sidewalk. Everything in place as it was before. Obscured at once by his awareness of it, the moment blurs. He cannot reach beyond it. He does not need to. At peace with himself, he walks home through the falling snow.